just giving a few minutes sure. for people to wrap up some of the meeting. Okay. All right, let's start with introductions and, okay. Hi all, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have with us uh, the brilliant Pulsar astronomer, Professor Ingrid Shares uh, from UBC. Uh, Ingrid did her PhD uh, from Princeton University with Professor Joe Taylor, and was thereafter a postdoctoral fellow at Jodrell Bank in UK and a research associate at NRAO in Green Bank Observatory. Since 2002, Ingrid has been at UBC as an assistant professor and was promoted to a full professor in 2012. Uh, professor Stairs has been instrumental in finding exotic pulsars with radio telescopes such as Arecibo and Green Bank Observatory. She times highly relativistic binaries such as double pulsar system and and wants to understand their evolution and studies transient phenomena such as fast radio bursts. Ingrid has constructed the coherent D dispersion instrument for Arecibo and Green Bank and is now leading the installation of a 10 beam pulsar instrument on the CHIME telescope. Professor Stairs is a key member of Nanograph and CHIME pulsar collaboration and elected fellow of the American Astronomical, uh, American Physical Society as of 2018 and was awarded the Royal Society of Canada's Rutherford Memorial Medal for Physics in 2017. Today, she will be talking to us about the wonderful new results from the double pulsar system, and uh, such as the precision strong field gravity tests. And I now open up the uh, session for Ingrid to take over. Thank you very much, Amruta, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come and speak here. I will just... Uh, Hope that I can make it in person sometime. I think yeah, that it would yeah, be wonderful. It would be very good. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I have a picture of the Parkes telescope behind me. Um, should probably have a picture of the Green Bank telescope, but that one has somehow gone AWOL and I couldn't find it. So Parkes it is, but that did contribute to the results that I'm going to show you today. Um, it, for a long time, I know that uh, the request for a new paper on the double pulsar timing was becoming a, a standing joke in the pulsar community because it was taking us a long time to figure out how to deal with all the systematics in there. But we finally got there. And uh, so the work that I'm going to present today is the result of you know the effort of many, many people. Michael Kramer at uh, MPIFR is the, the lead author on the result. Um, you know, I've looked after a lot of the green bank timing and other issues with the timing over the years too. So I guess that's why I'm up there. But uh, the list of people here who are named um, are sort of the core team of six of us who, you know, in the last couple of years, sort of since the start of the pandemic, actually, we really started to have very regular accountability check-ins to make sure that things got done. And um, you know, we brought in people like Bill Coles, who's an intel medium expert as needed. And eventually we did get this paper out. And so there's a whole lot of science in there. It's a 50 some odd page piece, if you want to actually sit down and read it. Um, but you know, we felt that level of detail was really necessary. It's also a nice comprehensive review, and this is due to Norbert, of all of the relativistic effects and what we're fitting and why they apply to this pulsar and how they can be parameterized on it, and also detailed comparison to other theories of gravity. So what I'll present today is a set of highlights from that paper. After first, of course, taking you through the necessary background on what pulsars are and how we time them. So, we have a good understanding of pulsars as the cores of massive stars that have undergone supernova explosions. Um, well, the typical masses we're talking about are something like 1.5 solar masses. There's a range, um, you know, we know some that are around two solar masses and actually in the double pulsar, the uh, less massive one is way down at 1.25 or thereabouts. 
radii, you know, on the order of 10 kilometers, getting a little bit larger than that, I think, according to the latest uh, fits from NICER and so on. But, you know, of that order. Magnetic fields have quite a range, and so do the spin rates. So these are very extreme environments, and uh, we're lucky to have them in the universe to be able to, first of all, understand them, but also to use them as tools to study other physics. So the double pulsar is one of the best examples of a really unique toolbox like this. Um, it is the only known double pulsar system at this point. We have, you know, on the order of a, a dozen or 15 double neutron star systems that are known at this point. But the double pulsar is the only one where both objects have been seen as pulsars. So in accordance with our understanding of evolutionary theory, one of those pulsars is a recycled one. It has had mass transferred from its evolving companion and been spun up in the process to a fast spin period of 22.7 milliseconds. That's the one we call pulsar A, also because it was discovered first. Pulsar B is the product of the second supernova explosion in the system, and um, it has a spin period of about 2.7 seconds. Now, B is actually undergoing a lot of relativistic geodetic precession, and its spin axis has moved so much that we haven't actually seen it as a pulsar in over a decade at this point, We're getting on for 15 years now almost. Um, there are various models of its beam shape that predict it should come back sometime soon, but um, you know, we're still keeping an eye out for it with no luck yet. Still, the A pulsar has been visible all the time and a nice reliable one that doesn't really seem to be undergoing geodetic session in any significant way, meaning with very little misalignment of its spin axis with the orbital angular momentum. And we'll talk some more about that in the timing in a bit. And uh, this system as a whole is a superb laboratory for re uh, general relativity tests. The orbit is just about 2.5 hours. So it's one of the fastest systems known. And its eccentricity is not huge, but it's non-zero. And that is what allows the measurement of many of these relativistic effects. If you want to translate that into more concrete terms, the typical separation between the two neutron stars is about three light seconds. And the velocities in the orbit uh, are around 300 kilometers per second. So pretty extreme. So, you know, as I said, we don't see B as a pulsar. We're looking through the data every month as we observe it with Green Bank. And, you know, when it does come back, you will hear about it. But you might want to know, you know why we're bothering, right? Why, why should we spend 16 years following this pulsar? Well, that's what's in the paper. It's been uh, getting closer to 20 years for the full set of observations now, I guess 19. Um, and that's because these kinds of objects allow us to test deviations from general relativity in an environment that uh, is different from what's going on in the solar system, for example. Um, you are close to objects here that are strongly self-gravitating, and that's a key point. Um, alternative theories of gravity, at least some of them, depend on the internal structures of objects like neutron stars, so particularly objects that are strongly self-gravitating. So coupling to extra fields, um, extra force carriers in this, these alternative theories can have a dependence on the internal structure of the neutron stars. This is something we don't expect in general relativity, right? Forbidden um, by strong equivalence principle and, and other concepts, right? Where the internal structure of an object doesn't matter, just the total mass. Um, so, you know, using pulsars to test GR in this way can give us insight into a regime of gravity that we can't test in the solar system. And then here is an, another uh, approach to uh, looking at the collection of you know, known gravitational tests or objects that are available for such tests. We have solar system things here with the lunar laser ranging and the Cassini measurement and so on. These are not places where you get very high space-time curvature, right? Even close into Sag A star, I mean, close in terms of its event horizon, which is fairly large, the curvature of space-time is not that big. So the double neutron star systems, oops, sorry, like, uh, go on, up here, um, you know, the uh, double pulsar here, this is actually the pulsar white dwarf triple system, and these are a couple of LIGO events, they really provide a, a different regime for doing these tests. 
So, you know, if we're ever going to poke a hole in GR, which maybe we never will, but, you know, if we're, if we're going to, it's worth exploring these different regimes to see if any discrepancies from GR could arise there that you wouldn't catch in another place on this diagram. So a little bit on pulsar timing. Um, there was another cartoon, well-established one of uh, you know, the pulsar spinning around and providing this sort of lighthouse effect where we get a blip of radiation every time it spins around. It's not usually that clean. Most pulses uh, from pulsars are not uh, exact replicas of a perfect beam shape. So there tends to be a lot of variation in pulse shape and intensity. Um, so here we've got an example of a rather boring slow pulsar, um, but uh, every single horizontal line here is a separate pulse from that pulsar. So you can see there's a huge variation in pulse shape and, uh, and strength. And sometimes you see an interpulse and sometimes you don't. So, um, while you can have these very extreme variations, when you add up several hundred or several thousand pulses, you do tend to get something stable. There are, of course, a few notable exceptions to that, and, and those are interesting cases too. But in general, you get a stable profile, which, you know, with a sufficiently long observation time, we call an integrated profile. Uh, one other thing I need to mention is how we deal with the uh, smearing that results from the slightly ionized interstellar medium. So there's a plasma frequency associated with that, which gives us a dispersive effect where the low frequencies in the system, uh, in the observing system arrive later than the high frequency ones following sort of a one over frequency squared law. And um, the factor that determines how much smearing you get is something we call the dispersion measure, which is just the column density of electrons between us and the pulsar. So it's the integral of the number density of electrons along the line of sight. And we usually use bizarre units of parsecs per cubic centimeter for this. Um, we have to take out this dispersive smearing if we're going to hope to build up the pulsar signal properly over our observing band. And um, there are a couple of techniques that are used for this. One is to make a filter bank with many narrow little channels, and that is always going to leave the filter shape convolved with your pulse profile and smear out sharp features. A much better approach is to use a baseband data acquisition system where you preserve the amplitude and phase information of the incoming signal and can then uh, mathematically apply the inverse filter that the ISM is applying to your data and line everything up perfectly. So this is the same pulse I hear now observed with coherent dispersion, as we call it, and you can see many more sharp features. These sharp features are great for doing pulsar timing because they really let you do a cross correlation um, with great precision. So this is how that works. This is actually the standard profile for the double pulsar at 820 megahertz as observed by the Green Bank Telescope. And you know, this is built up of many hours of data. There's very little noise in the baseline. We tend actually to zap out the baseline entirely so the noise doesn't contaminate the time of arrival in any way. But the idea is that any 30 second observation or few minute observation, if you will, is going to be basically a replica of that standard profile, but shifted by some amount and obviously containing some more noise. So we measure that shift in phase using a cross-correlation algorithm typically being done in the frequency domain. And then that offset can be turned into a time offset knowing the observed period of the pulsar at the time it was observed. So there's an iterative process here you might realize. We have to know an initial period of the pulsar to get that first transformation from um, a phase offset to a time offset. And then we can um, you know, iterate a few times and uh, really improve the time offset after uh, improving the timing solution. But once we have that time offset, we have what's called a time of arrival for a pulse that is representative of basically the midpoint of this observation. And so this of course requires a good time standard at the observatory. And uh, with that set of TOAs that we get, we need to transform them from telescope reference frame to the solar system barycenter reference frame. We use that because it's more or less inertial relative to the pulsar's reference frame. I'll talk about how it can't be perfectly inertial in, in a bit, but it's a pretty good approximation. 
And so once we have all of the TOAs in the solar system barycenter reference frame, we then enumerate every rotation of the pulsar. So we assign a pulse number to each and every uh, TOA that we have relative to a certain epoch at the center of the um, observ at the set of, center of the data set. And having that enumeration gives us the pulse numbers with no uncertainty, right? Those are just integers. And that you know, precision there, when you know exactly which pulse number it is out of several billion, gives you the ability to fit the frequency of the pulse, or the rotational frequency and the spin down rate and you know, all of the binary parameters and so on, also with high precision. Usually not uh, part in, in 10 to the 14 for all of the parameters, right? But you know, to pretty good precision. And we make sure that you know, we've done a good job by inspecting our residuals. So I'll show you a nice residual plot from the double pulsar in a bit. Here's just an example pulled from uh, the nanograv timing of the kind of thing we're looking for. So here's the data set we're working with. It's not just Green Bank, although that provides the uh, most precise TOAs. And so it is in many ways the most important data set in there. We cut that data set off a little bit before some of the other ones, notably parks. And so as you will see, some of the data quality looks a little less great, you know, starting toward the end. It's not because we stopped observing with the GBT, we just, you know, had to put a <laughs> timeline on uh, what we were actually including in the paper. So um, that's that's where that is. We, uh, you know, stopped using most of the European telescopes. This is Westerbork, this is Jodl Bank, Effelsberg and Nancy, of course, uh, around the same time. So they have a common cutoff for most of the telescopes and then a bit more data from Parkes. Parks was, of course, the telescope that discovered this pulsar in the first place. So the color coding here is just uh, giving you an idea of the observing frequencies used right? and also the observing bandwidths used. So you can see we've gone to very, very high bandwidth instruments, especially at Green Bank, and that has really helped our signal to noise and made us realize there were more systematics in our data than we had <laughs> previously imagined and that we needed to do a little more work to get rid of them. So we also do break the data into many subbands, as you can see here for, for Green Bank, and that helps us to look for variations in the dispersion measure, because we do have those. This is something you expect just from the motions of the Earth and the pulsar system through the interstellar medium. Um, having a single constant dispersion measure is not a realistic approach to uh, modeling the system. So this is a little diagram we made for the paper to sort of show how all the things we need to fit are interrelated. Um, understanding the interstellar medium variations, so the dispersion measure variations is key. And that is closely tied actually to our ability to measure the distance via timing parallax and also the astrometric position of the pulsar. We also have VLVI data that we bring in to help with that. But getting all of these things right is important, um, not least because the distance of the parallax also feeds into our understanding of the relativistic parameters we measure. So we have to actually do all of these things together to try to get one coherent understanding of the system out. And you know, iterating this many times is part of what uh, kept us occupied for so many years. So in particular, focusing on that interstellar medium bit and the distance determination at first, um, we treat the data in a slightly different way for this than we did for the actual relativistic timing measurements. So in particular, the Parkes data set is the longest one and uh, we really needed to use that for these measurements, but it's not as sensitive as the GBT. So what we did was use four minute integrations there and we binned down some of the other telescopes to four minutes also so that we would have comparable data sets from the various telescopes. And we then split the data up in roughly 100 day intervals and tried a few other ranges, but 100 day worked pretty well. And used the Tempo2 pulsar timing software to fit uh, dispersion measure and so-called common mode offset. So this would be something like pulse jitter or something like that. Something that shifts everything you know, together, but not necessarily follow, not actually following that one over frequency squared law. So it's treating dispersion measure a little bit differently from something that could be timing noise, could be jitter. Um, it just means that everything is, is moving 
together in a way. There could be other things absorbed into that, but we're not really using that um, later on in the timing. Um, so, you know, getting the dispersion measure variations understood properly was actually a, a very big part of the work done here. Um, so we did this with the 100 day binning, also tried to do it in uh, Monte Carlo to try to um, really get a good handle on it. With that, at the same time, we were fitting uh, the astrometric parameters as well. Right? So we're mostly holding the orbital parameters fixed, but fitting for position, proper motion, and the, the timing parallax. So, you know, we were confident in that. And what we ended up with then was this um, set of measurements of the dispersion measure at intervals of pretty much 100 days, which are the points that are shown here. Now we didn't want to use that directly in the timing. So what we ended up doing, um, Michael Kramer took care of this, was to model the overall dispersion measure changes with the Gaussian learning process. So we end up with a smooth set of explanations for the dispersion measure changes, and also with an associated uncertainty um, along the way. So you can see you know, before Green Bank observations with the um, high wide bandwidth instruments became uh, important um, or usable, you know, the uncertainties on the DM are fairly large. And again, out here, after we dropped uh, the Green Bank, you know, or didn't, didn't add any more Green Bank data, the uncertainties got a bit larger again. Right? But for most of the time, we actually have a pretty good set of DM measurements. And we're pretty confident that the, the GLP results here capture the DM changes pretty well. So we basically took this gray curve here and sampled that uh, along with the astrometry parameters, sampled from that as input to the full relativistic timing model. And so we turned all of that into a Monte Carlo as well to try to really um, get a good understanding of the parameter uncertainties, but also their covariances. So one of the things you can do with you know, these changes in dispersion measure like that is to get a structure function, right? So that's what's done up here uh, using the DM measurements here. So this is basically how the uh, square differences between DM values changes as a function of different lags between the, the DM. So you sum up over that. And that's what's in the black points here. Uh, the cross down here is a similar, it's an equivalent thing that has been derived from how the pulsar scintillates over short time scales through diffractive scintillation. So the time scale is, as you can see, very, very different, right? It's uh, down to sort of minutes here. Um, the blue lines here show the slope of the structure function that you would expect from a Kolmogorov spectrum, right? the Kolmogorov turbulent spectrum in the interstellar medium, so with a slope of about five thirds. That actually does a reasonably good job of connecting the diffractive scintillation point up to you know, the start of our DM measured points, but then things flatten. And one of the things that Bill Coles helped to work out in the paper was that this uh, indicates that there is a, a thin scattering screen near the pulsar probably um, that has a thickness of about eight astronomical units, so fairly small. So you know, we're not in a purely Kolmogorov regime up here. Getting back to the distance, and I'm going to put all this together in, in a moment. Um, you know, I mentioned we used VLBA, uh, well, it was the VLBA telescope, so VLBI method, to uh, <coughs> excuse me to get a good estimate of the parallax. Now we can do it from timing also, where we're basically looking at changes in the curvature of the wavefront as it hits the, the Earth, um, or Earth sampling different parts of the curved wavefront, that's a better way to look at it, as it goes through its orbit. Um, so we can get a timing signature that way. It's not super high precision. It's shown in the red um, curve here. The uh, VLBI, you know, is much more directly geometric and the results for right ascension are shown over in the left hand side here declination looks kind of similar the observations were carefully chosen to sample the peaks of the expected uh, parallax curve so that you know we knew we were right on there um that's easily predictable from the position on the sky right so you know 
this gives you a measurement of the parallax with a much smaller uncertainty. Right? So that's indicated by the black line here. We did in the end decide to use the weighted mean of the two fits, which, you know, of course, as you can see here, is quite dominated by the VLBI measurement. But, you know, we think that's probably better overall. Um, and hopefully with even more precise data coming out from Meerkat uh, over the next while, we will really nail this parallax down even better and, and maybe get a better timing parallax out of it as well. But uh, at this point, we think we trust the timing parallax better, uh, sorry, the um, astrometric parallax better than the timing parallax. And the distance that results is uh, just over 700 parsecs from us. So that and the scattering screen. Um, uh, and to, yeah, and with, yeah. This is three. Aren't you bothered yes, by the think. discrepancy between the two methods on the previous? Do I want to comment on it more? Yeah. Well, um, sorry. So, you know, this, this, first of all, it is a fairly small signal in the timing data, right? Um, you know, we, we only measure it with a few sigma precision, and it may very well be that there's still some covariance issues with our DM fitting in there. We did run through an enormous range of tests, and this was the best thing we settled on that, that you know, we, we did use simulated data and all kinds of things too to see how our techniques would affect what we were able to measure. This is, you know, the best we can do with the timing at the moment. It may very well be that with higher precision timing, we'll get a different result. Obviously, the uncertainty here is large enough to encompass quite a range of things. It's not technically inconsistent with the VLBI fit as it is. But, uh, you know. Do you have any plans to continue doing VLBI? Because the, the points seemed very sparse on the, on the left panel. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't think there's ongoing VLBI. No, actually we are putting in, I think we are going to do a little bit more. Uh, Adam Duller is in charge of this part of it. Um, but we're also, you know, there are prospects with Meerkat also in the, the medium term, which uh, has even better sensitivity than Green Bank or the VLBA. Right? So um, hopefully it won't be too much longer before we have a really, really solid measurement. Okay. Thanks. But you know, we have two full cycles here, so it's not all bad. That's okay for now, Shri? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. So yeah, putting these things together, you know, we have this uh, thin scattering screen and uh, an approximate or you know, reasonably good distance. Um, we can look at where this object is on the sky <clears throat> and it is near this gum nebula, which is something that is quite hard to model in um, you know, these various attempts people have made of uh, associating different amounts of dispersion measure with different distances in the galaxy. So in other words, trying to estimate the ionized electron content along different lines of sight. Um, excuse me. So you can see here, well, where the gum nebula really is. And uh, you know, this is typically treated in these ISM models as just a, a circular object, right? The double pulsar, as you can see, lands sort of right on the edge of it, um, right? And the, the distance that we have, the 735 parsecs, is consistent with it being just behind the gum nebula so that the scattering screen would make sense as some kind of filament in that nebula. So there's a self-consistent story here. Um, you know, the question is where exactly it lies in relation to the nebula that, you know, this is something we will work out, but um, we think it makes sense that it would be behind there. Um, in terms of using the existing DM distance models to constrain it, uh, that's, you know, a little tricky to do. The um, uh, what we refer to as the uh, uh, YMW model, YMW16, um, <coughs> that uh, actually, you know, uh, originally had the gum nebula being a little bit smaller, and so the pulsar was outside it, and that it really affected how it made a prediction for the pulsar, making the gum nebula just a little bit bigger could change things radically in there. So, you know, the quality of the model is obviously pretty crude with this uh, simple circle here. So we're not going to get any answers from doing that, but, you know, once we do move on and get an even better uh, parallax to this thing, we might have something useful to say about uh, you know, 
the structure of this object, or at least in that localized part of it. So that's a bit what of an aside. Uh, Sorry. What is the proper motion in galactic coordinates? Is it along the plane? Um, in galactic coordinates, I don't remember offhand. Okay. It has uh, a very small proper motion, though. It is mostly in the plane. In the plane, OK. Well, mostly within cool. the plane, yeah. That's very interesting. And it's, it's a small proper motion. We'll get to that a bit toward, toward the end of the talk, too. So I'd like to actually talk a little bit about the relativistic timing solution. Um, so here we are using then 30 second integrations. And so Green Bank is dominating things. Parks is a little less useful. Um, so we've got here the Green Bank uh, data split into two different frequencies, 1400 megahertz and 820 megahertz. These are different uh, instruments at Green Bank. So the old narrow band GASP instruments, and these are guppy here, first used in an incoherent observing mode and later on in a coherent one once that got working. Um, Parks, it's uh, different receivers and yeah, various generations of instruments there as well. Um, but you notice the difference in the residual scales here, right? At 820 megahertz and Green Bank, we're looking at you know under 50 microseconds RMS and up at Parks, it's almost an order of magnitude larger. Um, this is the, these are the residuals versus time. You can see they, they look pretty Gaussian when you make the histogram, so we're quite happy with that. Here are residuals versus orbital phase, and this line here is not a uh, not one really bad binned residual, but it is uh, the place where you have the superior conjunction where you expect the Shapiro delay to be important. So we'll be talking about that in in a bit too. Um, you know, again, that looks pretty nice. So we're confident at this point that we've modeled everything in a reasonable way. And uh, yeah, let's talk about the parameters a little bit. So a binary pulsar in its simplest uh, form is just like a single line spectroscopic binary. So you can get uh, you know, five basic Keplerian parameters. The orbital period is easy. You get the projected semi-major axis. So you can't tell a priori whether you've got a large orbit like this or a small orbit edge on. But you can measure the eccentricity, E, and the longitude of periastron and the time of periastron passage quite easily. When you have an eccentric system that is you know, fairly close in, you can start to measure a lot of corrections to this basic Keplerian orbit, which you expect to come from um, the theory of general relativity or some alternative theory of gravity. The trick is that we measured these things in a theory independent formalism that was developed by Demo de Ruel uh, back in the 80s. And then we can inspect each of the terms that we get and, and check for their agreement either individually or altogether with whatever theory of gravity you like. So, here are the parameters that we measure. We get the advance of periastron of the, uh, the shift of the orbit. And that is now to the second post-Newtonian order. And it also has a dependence on the moment of inertia of pulsar A. We can't completely uh, measure it yet, but we can constrain it a little. We get the time dilation and gravitational redshift, which have the same uh, quantitative effect on the orbit. There is the orbital period decay, which now also has to include mass loss from the system based on the spin down of pulsar A. And if we leave that out, we get something that doesn't quite make sense. We get Shapiro delay with the shape, in other words, uh, related to the inclination angle and the range, which is related to the mass of pulsar B. We get a relativistic uh, deformation of the orbit. And then we get these uh, next leading order terms, which I will, uh, you know, hand wave my way through, but you can look at the paper for the full mathematical description. And so that's sort of another term in the Shapiro delay and an aberration effect as well. So here's a cartoon of some of these things. If you can measure two of the parameters of that list of post-Keplerian parameters, then you can get the two masses and the inclination angle, which are also connected by the mass function. If you measure three or more, then you have the chance to do a self-consistency test of GR or your other favorite theory of gravity. Um, I think GR is going to remain my personal favorite here. But this is uh, just giving you some cartoonish illustrations of what's uh, going on in these different PK parameters. So let's talk about the Shapiro delay for a second, excuse me. 
So this is what happens when the uh, pulsar A, and actually I'm going to set it this way, pulsar A travels behind pulsar B, right? And so the signal from it has to travel through the gravitational well of pulsar B on the way to us. So the full delay that we expect looks something like this. And the exact shape that you have depends on the inclination of the orbit and the eccentricity and so on. What we can actually measure is more like the bottom panel here, which is a smaller peak to peak effect. And that's because some of this shape here can be absorbed by a redefinition of the semi-major axis of the orbit. So you can't separate that out easily. But in this case, the, um, the system is so relativistic that when you do take out that component that can be modeled as a, a change in A1, you've still got a big signal left. And you know it's very strong. The residuals here we have shown binned uh, as a function of orbital phase. And we have also, if you'll notice, um, set up the orbital phase so that uh, we're, we've always got the same definition of when the pulsar is behind the companion. So we have enough um, you know, periastron advance here that this is something we have to account for all the time as, uh, as we go forward. What I've got over on the other panel is this um, next to leading order term in the Shapiro delay. So this, uh, again, for comparison here, this is sort of two and a half microseconds in amplitude compared to the roughly 80 microseconds over here. So it's a small fraction of the total effect, but it actually you know, is an important thing. If you just take the Shapiro delay um, you know, in the old standard de um set of uh, parameters that, that correspond to the, the fit and, and subtract them off, you will see this set of blue signals here when you have the points been together. And in fact, the curve that you can predict um, from our understanding of GR theory, um, you know, is given by this red curve here. And if we allow a fit for the amplitude of that, then we get the black curve. But let me explain a little bit about what uh, what's actually going on here. So there are actually two terms in here that have the same um, excuse me, the same mathematical dependence on the orbital terms. So one thing is we've got A passing behind B for the Shapiro delay, but it's not just A that's moving, B is also moving. So part of the effect is, you know, B's position is changing as the, the light signals are propagating through the gravitational well. And so you get a small shift in the Shapiro delay, you know, later before, uh, the conjunction and a little bit earlier after conjunction because of that. The next term is an aberration term, which involves the spin direction of A. So I'm still got B out in front of me here, but I've got, you can imagine A spinning this way. Um, when A is uh, on this side of B, as it's traveling this way, the signal sort of has to go through a slightly longer uh, path to get to us, causing the delay. Whereas over here, it sort of gets helped by the uh, spin, uh, by the uh, gravitational well and arrives a little bit earlier. This would be the opposite if the spin for A was pointing down, right? Um, no, I can't, I can't <laughs> do that very easily, but it would be early on the, the original side of the uh, conjunction and then late afterwards. So the sign of the red curve would flip if A was misaligned with the orbital angular momentum. So the fact that we see it um, you know, going up here tells us that the spin of A has to be pointing or the, in the same direction as the orbital angular momentum. So this is great, but we kind of knew this beforehand. And this is now a, an independent confirmation of it. We knew that because as far as we can tell, A does not undergo geodetic precession. Um, this is work that my former PhD student did looking at the uh, profile shape of A over several years and finding absolutely no difference in the profile over time. If A spin axis was misaligned with the orbital angular momentum and, and processing around it, you would expect to see a change in the pulse profile over time, as we see with B. And we don't see that. So that was our first clue that we had either, you know, perfect align or close to perfect alignment or close to perfect misalignment. For evolutionary reasons with the K 
ticks that uh, can happen in neutron stars, the, um, the aligned scenario would be preferred here. We had another line of evidence, uh, which I don't have time to explain properly, but it uh, has to do with the interaction between the uh, B pulses and the A wind back when B was still observed as a pulsar. Uh, A's wind induced sort of a striping pattern in the B pulses, which you can actually look for frequencies in and uh, think about in sort of a sidereal um, versus solar day kind of uh, difference. And you can get a sense of A's rotation from that as well. So this was work by Nihan Paul a few years ago. Um, that also pointed toward, uh, you know, the A um, spin being aligned with the orbital angular momentum. So this bit of timing evidence is, you know, another strong confirmation of that. And it's really nice to have everything actually fitting together with this. The plot everybody loves, of course, is the uh, damping of the orbit over time due to the emission of gravitational radiation. You know, the plot like this is what uh, got Joe Taylor and Russell Hulse the Nobel Prize back in 1993 for the Hulse-Taylor pulsar. Um, we're beating the Hulse-Taylor pulsar for this now, but uh, you know I think the main point of that science, of course, happened. Still, uh, it's a beautiful shot here. What we've got is the cumulative shift of periastron, so how much earlier periastron happens as the orbit is shrinking over time. With no damping due to the emission of gravitational waves, you know, that would follow a straight line up here at zero. But as it is, uh, it follows this nice parabola shape as predicted by GR and for the residuals relative to that uh, parabola shape. So there's uh, there's no question that it lands right on what you expect. And our um, you know, test of GR in, in this particular case uh, can be summed up by this relationship here, this, this fraction. Um, you can see this perfect agreement with the 1.0 that one might expect. Now, those of you who have possibly heard me talk about 1534 plus 12 in the distant past, uh, still an interesting pulse there too, um, will remember that uh, we can't just take the observed uh, PB dot, as we call it, and um, assume that that is the, the true value um, that applies right at the pulsar. This is where we get into the fact that the solar system barycenter is not perfectly inertial relative to the pulsar system center of mass. So both systems are you know, being affected by the gravitational field of the galaxy and you know, affected in a slightly different way. So their accelerations are a bit different. There's another component um, which is due to the pulsar's proper motion across the sky in what we call the Shklovsky effect. So it's always going to look like the pulsar is accelerating away from you, just a V squared over R um, uh, amount of acceleration. So these things are illustrated in the plot that I've got down here, which is kind of old and out of date now, but the basic idea remains. This is work by a, a student at MPIFR. Um, so the Shklovsky correction is shown by the turquoise lines here. The proper motion is well measured, right? Um, but the amount of the correction is going to then vary with distance here. So that's down here on the, the bottom axis. So this is mu squared d, which is equivalent to v squared over r. And uh, the galactic acceleration difference correction is uh, given by the blue line down here with some you know, indication of the uncertainty here. Happily, these two have opposite signs and very nearly cancel each other out. So there is not a strong dependence on the distance to the pulsar in all of this. These red lines show what we thought at the time was the best distance to the pulsar and the blue line that I put in here is about where we think it is nowadays. So, you know, there's a, there's a small correction applied based on where we know the distance to be now, right? But uh, even if the distance is wrong, it's not affecting our measurement of PB dot very much. Um, where it does start to matter a little bit um, is in the hopes of ever measuring the moment of inertia of A. So what I've got here is the full mass mass diagram for the pulsar. So this is taking all of the measured, excuse me, um, post Keplerian parameters with the exception of delta theta and working out what they correspond to in terms of the two pulsar masses, assuming that GR is correct. So we've got the mass of pulsar A on the bottom here and the mass of pulsar B on the top. 
And there are error bars on all of these parameters that are you know, smaller than the thicknesses of the lines, basically. Um, so there are all of the standard um, post Keplerian parameters we've talked about. There's the mass ratio, which we get from the, the sizes of the two orbits. We haven't been able to update that too much because you know, we don't see B anymore, so we're not really improving its uh, mass, its uh, A1 measurement too much. And then we've got a, a measurement here of the geodetic precession of B from the eclipse studies done by René Breton a while ago. And that's something that we hope will get uh, updated soon. Um, so if we uh, blow up the inner part of this diagram here, same color coding, we have gamma here, the time dilation and gravitational redshift parameters. We've got the shape of the Shapiro delay. We've left out the range of the Shapiro delay because it's actually comparatively large. But we've got PB dot here in purple, which is steadily shrinking down and, you know, which is becoming important. And then we've got a couple of different lines for the advance of periastron. So we have um, omega dot with a knot attached to it, which is sort of the raw measured omega dot. And that is um, still including the 2PN values as well. But, you know, we now realize we have to correct this to account for the orbital precession that is due to the equation of state of the neutron star. And so effectively the spin orbit coupling um, between the, um, the pulsar A and the orbit. And so we've got a range here going from soft to, uh, to stiff equations of state. And so we've picked sort of a, a median value or one particularly sensible value uh, to sort of draw a dark gray line through. So we have a case now where we realize we do need to make this correction for the moment of inertia. Um, if we didn't do it, it would be, uh, you know, in less great agreement with PB dot, but we can't say that we're making a separate measurement yet. Eventually, we hope that the error bars on PB dot will shrink down enough that we'll be able to really nail down which of the equations of state that we need. Right now, there's still a range that's allowed. But, you know, that does give us um, a fair bit of, uh, of uh, really reasonably good constraint on uh, the moment of inertia that's consistent with other measurements. I said we did measure delta theta. Um, that does have some covariance with gamma. Um, so, you know, that's not a great measurement yet, but it is needed. And uh, the hulse Taylor pulsar actually got there first in terms of publishing the, the result, but um, you know, it's nice to have it in another system as well. So this is the term that describes the, um, the sort of distortion of the orbit from a pure you know, ellipse kind of thing, although it wouldn't close anyway, but uh, it's not just described by a simple eccentricity, but it has to um, have this extra distortion in it. So that's what that parameter describes. So here are the, uh, the moment of inertia constraints and the two masses. So this is, <clears throat> so we've got some gray regions on here, which, um, you know, are sort of theoretically derived. And we've got a few points on here that represent nicer and LIGO measurements, um, and then sort of a Bayesian model incorporating the best knowledge of you know, all existing measurements. And then our blue region here is sort of what is allowed for the moment of inertia based on our omega dot PB dot combination. So we're not, you know, we're not measuring it, right? We don't uh, cut off going down here to zero, but we have a constraint and it's consistent with the other things, you know, um, going to giving us a radius of less than 22 kilometers at 90% confidence. Okay, that's not exciting yet compared to nicer, but we're on the way. And there's hope that with Meerkat and later SKA, we will really get to the point of having an actual measurement. You can see then the, the masses over here as well, and they shift around a little bit. Um, so total mass and then masses of A and B, um, they shift around a little bit depending on how you shift omega due to different equations of state being used. So this is sort of showing you the, the range of possible values that it can take on. So, you know, again, we have a self-consistent picture here. Uh, there we go, okay. Yeah, sorry, the uh, keyboard is slow here. All right. So we have, you know, nice self-consistency within general relativity. 
And, um, you know, then you could ask, well, what constraints does this place on other theories of gravity? So mostly what we chose to focus on in the paper was constraints that could be derived from um, you know, this particular class of relativity theories or gravitational theories, uh, which we loosely call de Morin Esposito Farez gravity. So this um, adds a couple of parameters to what you would expect in GR. So we call these alpha naught and beta naught, and they basically represent um, a linear and nonlinear coupling to you know, an external field. So these two parameters, then their coupling strength with the neutron star can depend on that internal structure of, of the neutron star. So we plot curves for different uh, representative equations of states, um, stiff equations of state and then soft equations of state over here on the left. For the double pulsar, which you know provides the strongest constraint on the nonlinear part of the coupling. And then for a couple of, uh, well, this is a neutron star white dwarf system, and this is the triple pulsar two white dwarf system here. So that system is still the most interesting um, out here uh, for uh, large values of beta naught, but the double pulsar is important in cutting things off here at uh, small, at, at, well, I guess, large magnitude negative uh, beta naught values. So, you know, we're chipping away at that parameter space. I'll just point out that the Brands-Dickey gravity is a special case of this where the, um, the uh, nonlinear term is zero. And this is a logarithmic scale here, right? So these parameters are pretty small. We use a, a, a similar um, description of uh, the, you know, the parameterization to um, basically show an example of how you can rule out one version of Tevez. Um, Tevez has been, of course, you know, severely harmed, hopefully with a stake through his heart by, by LIGO, but uh, these theories have a habit of coming back. <laughs> you don't want them to. But anyway, we're just demonstrating here in the right-hand diagram what a mass-mass diagram can look like for a theory that doesn't work. So here we've taken the, the parameter for Tevez to be 0 0.04. This gives you sort of a, a natural transition from Newtonian gravity to the Mondian regime, right? Um, natural is, a, of course, a relative term here. Um, but if you do look at the theory with um, that parameter value as an example, it will produce mass mass curves for all of these objects that just don't actually intersect at a common point. So you can say that this theory has been um, effectively ruled out by the double pulsar timing. You know, um, that said, there are probably still small regimes of parameter space that could end up working, but this one doesn't. Right? So, you know, we're often asked for an alternative theory of gravity that we can rule out. So here's an example of one. Back to the question of the uh, velocity, and I'm getting close to the end of the talk here. Um, you know, we measure a, a very small proper motion that actually corresponds to um, a space velocity, you know, just over 10 kilometers per second or so. So quite small, and it is mostly in the plane. Um, we can make a, you know, an estimate of um, what its, you know, total velocity could be relative to the local standard of rest uh, at, at its location based on just assuming the velocity is um, randomly oriented, you know, relative to us or relative to its own LSR, does, it almost doesn't matter very much since it's close by. Um, and, uh, you know, that allowed 90% um, set of radial velocities is given by the gray region here. So the overall velocity relative to its own local standard of rest is very small, under 50 kilometers a second. And as you can see, the vertical component out of the plane of the galaxy is, is tiny, right? So most of its motion is actually in the plane of the galaxy. So the inference from this is that the supernova that created B, whatever the event was, um, had to have a fairly low kick in order to produce such a small space velocity. This also fits with the very small misalignment angle of A that, you know, that we've now measured also with timing. Uh, so this is something that, you know, my group and, and other people have been arguing about since uh, 
early after the detection of the um, the double pulsar. I mean, the Piran and Shaviv had arguments about that early on. Vicky Calagera's group has done a lot of modeling of, of the system. Um, you know, with that low space velocity, it's really hard to achieve that unless you have also quite a small kick. And so one of the things this points to is a supernova that, you know, might have been an electron capture supernova um, or a more generally um, what's ultra stripped helium star that, that went supernova in Thomas Torres's preferred language. Um, that also fits with the low mass of uh, pulsar B down at 1.25, with the idea being that the electron capture supernova would be quite likely to happen once you get to about 1.37, 1 1 1.38 uh, solar masses or so for the progenitor white dwarf type object. So you know, again, there's a coherent story here. Things really fit together pretty well. So that's most of what I want to say about the uh, the big GBT and parks and so on paper. But uh, you know we have Meerkat nowadays, and this is one of the prime targets that we're looking at. Um, I I'm not hugely involved with a lot of Meerkat things because you know with time to do I've, I've I've got enough on my plate. But I keeping a you know my fingers into the relativistic binary timing group there. And so obviously the double pulsar is of huge interest here. And this is a glimpse from, you know, sort of our initial, here's what we can do paper from last year, of what the eclipses look like for the double pulsar. This is at L-band, 1400 megahertz, and this is at UHF, which is like eight to 800 to a gigahertz kind of. And you can see pulsar A appearing, disappearing, being blocked intermittently by the magnetosphere of B as it goes through eclipse. So this is what René Breton used to model the geodetic precession of B about 15 years ago. And um, it's something that you know, we're going to be hopefully um, getting a paper out to, you know, within the next year or so. Michael Kramer has a student uh, working on this. And of course, the, the timing is uh, correspondingly better as well. So there's some really good prospects for the future. So here's my summary slide. And uh, of course, I can't resist uh, hyping the SKA in the end, because we might find even more relativistic systems once we get that up and running. So thanks, and uh, hopefully there's still time for some questions and a little chat. Thank you, Ingrid. That was a wonderful talk and a great explanation also for some of the younger students. So I see Shree's hand is already up. Of course. <laughs> uh, Ingrid. Uh, yeah. I would say, you know, I know there's a whole cottage industry of these alternative GR things. Yes. But I, I would, I, re, I, did, I think uh, an observer like you shouldn't waste time with that because the moment you have a plot with that M1, M2, all the lines going through this, and there's no suggestion of even a hint or something. So, you know, it's like you have Newtonian mechanics and you see Mercury sort of doing something you don't expect. Then you can dig around and start thinking of this. This is like trying to find work when you don't have evidence. And <laughs> I understand I understand theorists want to do that because that's to keep themselves busy. But I really kind of surprised that observers are getting into doing something which for which there is nothing. So wow. anyway, I, I'm I mean, that's a that's a philosophical question, I would say. Um, you know, I think if if we are going to find deviations from GR, wouldn't it be most likely to happen in some place with fairly strong gravitational fields? Oh, oh no, I'm with you. I love the test. Yeah. All I'm saying is I would end my talk by saying M1, M2, it goes through this chi squared reduced equals one and not even bother talking about this alternative theorist because it has no basis. There's no physics there at all. Physics well, starts with some real evidence of something new and there's nothing new GR apparently is a stunning theory. And it is. Need, yeah. But anyway. I mean, yet we have people who, who keep promoting their pet theories. And I think there, there is validity to saying that, uh, you know, we can rule these things out or at least severely constrain them. And so it, if nothing else, it forces them into an uncomfortable part of the parameter space. Uh, you're underestimating the uh, uh, theorist friends here. Yeah. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the, the, more seriously, the you said something about the moment of inertia. Um, and uh, uh, your moment of inertia, for which I'm very hopeful you'll find with, uh, with uh, especially with Meerkat coming on, mm -hmm. 
it will be a true moment of inertia. In contrast, the nicer stuff is very model dependent. It's not a measurement. Okay, there are different people with their own little spot here, little spot there, elliptical, so on and so forth. So uh, it's a good thing to do, but it is not a fund. NISA is not making fundamental measurements. Yeah, I mean, I I would sort of agree with you. I wouldn't be maybe so harsh on NICER, but uh, I, you know, I, one good thing there is that they do have separate teams doing the analyses and, and the modeling, and they do keep coming up with consistent results. So in that sense, it is good. But yes, I, I completely agree with you that it is model dependent still. And so ours will beat that when we do get the measurement. Well, I'm done with my rant and rave. <laughs> Um, well, other people are raising hands. I had one quick question. So um, there is this distance discrepancy, right, compared to the current measurement versus the real BI. And I was trying to understand, like, if similar thing has been observed for other systems as well that you can think of? Um, smaller discrepancies, but uh... You know, there. So there, uh, we do get a bunch of similar measurements from like the the nanograv and, and other international pulsar timing array um, estimates, and a lot of the time they are in pretty good agreement. Um, you know, there is an ongoing uh, set of, of VLBA measurements as well, right? Um, yeah. So Adam Deller and and Shami Chatterjee and, and all those great people are are leading those. Um, so. Um, there are sometimes some some small discrepancies and yeah. slight differences also in some of the astrometry, like the, the actual position or, or proper motion measurements that where there isn't complete agreement and we're not entirely sure of the sources of, of those, right? Um, mm -hmm. I will say that for the distance measurement, the VLBI distance measurement that we presented here, um, the fit Adam ended up using um, took our timing uh, position and proper motion and, and help those fit okay. and uh, just fit for the distance. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think there's one more question from Ranga. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned about the time delays indicating uh, evidence for a screen of about 8 AU thickness. So that was, oh. yeah. Yeah. That was the uh, structure function of the uh, Oh, yeah, right. From the structure. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah. what is this from? Is this just a structure in the nebula? Is this probably outflow from the progenitor star? No, or... no oh. it's probably structure in the nebula, I think. That's, um, I mean, you can see that it's quite a messy environment. Um, you know, the, the envelopes of the progenitor stars would have, you know, long ago been yeah, right. Way in the supernova explosion. So you wouldn't expect to have debris from that uh, hanging around. So it seems much more logical to blame the nebula here. Okay, and but why is it so thin? Um, that's a, a good question. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is obviously a, a complex environment, right? You've got a few supernova remnants in the area. I am not an expert on modeling the interstellar medium. So I. I would hesitate to give a definite mechanism, but you know, you do have plenty of gas moving around qualitatively, at least. It seems reasonable to assume you could compress uh, gas in a small region like that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so we are almost five minutes over the time today. Um, I wanted to say that if uh, anyone wants to meet up with Ingrid later on during this week, please let me know and I can help set up meetings, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. Um, yeah. all right. I, I don't have a huge ton of time because somehow yeah. I'm in an all-day meeting on Friday and I have to teach tomorrow, but we'll, we can sort something out here or there. Yeah, exactly. And thanks everyone for joining today. The lecture would be, uh, the colloquium would be available online as well on YouTube. And thank you, Ingrid, for joining us virtually. Yeah, thank you very talk. much for the invitation and uh, hope to see you in person sometime soon. Yeah, exactly. All right. Oh, I see Tom Prince is there too. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Um, Ingrid, I would also be logging off. Thank you again for joining okay, us. Thank you. Yeah. See you another time. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, Ingrid. Bye.